ipsissima verba, the very word. From worshiping the sun, man grew to worshiping the sun. And so I cannot help but wonder just how far we've really come since every prophet of the high imperium has said the light of the divine is meant to shine in everyone. And so I took a look at dogma, for I've always found it sound odd and discovered that it's backward. Turned around, it spells out am God. Next, I took the Holy Eucharist and saw that with a letter switch, a door appears to paradise because it now spells you a Christ. And then I found an atheist bound by no faith cannot exist. For breathe a space twixt A and T, and a theist shows up <laughs> instantly. Then I found the word theocracy, where church and state dictate united, and governmental policy is said to be divinely guided, is actually a homonym, which means it has a verbal twin. The alternate theocracy, spelled with an S and not a C, is not in every dictionary, which is itself a commentary. For theocracy means union of the personal soul, with God within, around, and above. So, what need have we for admonitions, taboos, decrees, or prohibitions when all are guaranteed admission to the promised land? By definition, so, that's that one. Thank you. Do you want to do one of yours? I thought, you know, I thought about that in Christian uh, on our team here, who you've, I love that you guys have developed your own relationship yeah, we as well. Have. I love this man. <laughs> I know, he's His great. vision statement, you've seen his vision statement? Uh, no. Have I seen your vision statement? You're, you're entering, you're entering, we're breaking the fourth wall now. Christian is coming out yes, from behind could, from behind the fourth wall. And now would you read he has it? a vision would you statement. It? Comes, step into the light, my friend. I, I Step into it. the light, my friend, and take the microphone. Let's go. All right. <laughs> and, and Christian, I shared it with a husband and wife who are spiritual awakeners. I read that to them and... Um, the wife gasped. It's so profound. It's so true. It's so beautiful. It's so clear. Sorry about the okay. Oh, look at you go. Look at you go. All right. Come over to this side. And uh, I don't know if this will go high enough for you, but I'm going to give you my seat. And I will, uh, I will hang out in the background here. <sighs> yeah, so... Part of my work in bringing people onto the show, it's been really beneficial for me to frame it in the way that I shared with you. And the way that I put it and the way that I see myself with a mythopoetic lens is I see myself as a scout who hunts down the imaginal cells of a more beautiful world and leads them to platforms that amplify their signal. And so you do. I just so appreciate you. And look at who you're apprenticing to. I mean, you are a young man on the rise and, and of such a humble, sweet, inquiring nature and serving. Just gorgeous. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not wearing my biogeometry pendant. <laughs> my fairy wanted to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. For putting me on the spot. <laughs> well, in our little break there, I found a poem that was actually potentially going to be forever lost unless I, unless I looked for it just now because uh, I recorded it and then it just went off into the ether somewhere. So I can, oh. I can offer this poem and then 
maybe something else I found that's not exactly a poem, but it's a, it's a very meaningful thing that I can uh, potentially share. I would, not potentially. <laughs> <laughs> do, yeah. Do, well, which it gives me the opportunity to introduce the word entelechy, uh, which means an actuality versus a potentiality. We all talk about actualizing our potential, uh, absent the awareness that there's already a word for it, not only of an, actual, an actualization, but the inner force within that, for instance, um, turns, uh, you know, causes the acorn to burst open and a tree grow. That is, the word for it is entelechy. And that's not one of your words. That's a word that oh, I no, could no, look no. up. Oh, no, no, no. It's a Greek word, yeah. Uh -huh. I think it belongs to Aristotle initially. <laughs> yeah, it's the intelligence contained within the acorn that has all the intelligence of the tree. Is that the idea? Well, uh, to me... Um, that was my expansion on it, my uh -huh. expression of my understanding, is simply that that force within us, the self-actualizing energy yeah. within us. And right now it's on, um, uh, it's really. It's revved up. We got it. Very we've been watering up. it and we've been giving it sunlight. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and here we are. Yeah. All right. Here's a poem. Tyranny is not the virus, it is the host. It is not the ghost, it is the house. We know tyranny in our bones because there's a tyrant in our shoes. Mm. Born into a world of win-lose, of don'ts and do's, the eight billion people pyramid game of trying to elevate your name mm. above that other girl, over that guy right there. Why are people following them anyway? What about what I have to say? Wait, never mind. I'm not going to say anything. What if I get it wrong? People will get mad at me, criticize me, judge me, cancel me. What if I'm not actually better than them? What if we're all actually the same? What if I can't win the game? I'm just not going to play, sing, dance, do anything. Safer that way, hey? And that, my friends, is how tyranny becomes the substrate upon which your united state of consciousness is staked. So if tyranny is the host, then freedom is the virus. And it's contagious inside the social distance. So take off your mask and expose yourself to it. Touch it, feel it, taste it, fuck it. The ecstasy of liberation injecting into your cells, infecting self-condemnation, extracting you from hell, changing your DNA, showing you a different way to live. Without a despot ruling from above, but emergent from the source field of love. Then you become the host, terrorizing the house of tyranny as the Holy Ghost, singing hymns of peace as an act of war, not against but for the more beautiful world we came here for. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. I mean, it, it was like a, a visionary trip, yeah. an altered state of consciousness. Yeah powerful thank you thank you yeah these poetry for me is interesting is i just need to get like a thread it's like a thread comes down from yes, from I the know. ether it's just like a string of a kite and sometimes it's windy up there and heavy and i can't quite pull it down but oftentimes as soon as i get a hold of the thread i can pull down the whole and does it all come yarn. at once often if i'm in the current i can keep going with it and then I let it sit for a minute, and then from there I get to refine it, you know, and, and then it gets typically better as I iterate over uh -huh. it. Oh, good. But I usually get most of it out with a, with a thrust, and sometimes I just get enough of a thread where I know that I could go back, and if I wanted to and I felt inspired, I could go weave it all the way through, and mm. sometimes it just goes all the way through. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Very sensuous experience. It is, yeah. I think it's one of the things. I think early as a earlier as a poet, you get a little bit lost in the artifice of creating poetry, like the rhyme, the cadence, the how the. But then eventually, it becomes more like a rhythm. It becomes more like a dance with words, rather than uh, you know some kind of engineering project. And I think if you make poetry an engineering project, it's not going to be fun, and <laughs> it's not going to it's not going to feel right. You know what I mean? It's the, of course the creative constraint is part of what makes poetry beautiful, but 
there's it really is more of a it's more of a rhythm it's more of a feeling it's a transmission rather than a an architectural project yes absolutely and in terms of rhyme being an artifice um i want to share with you my Pyrian penchant for punning and rhyme <laughs> And Pyrian, I believe it's uh, an island in Macedonia, said to be the home of the muses. And so, <clears throat> my tongue is naturally curly, so my words come out in rhyme. This started very early and still happens all the time. I've done my best to compensate, to speak in tidy rows of prose, but for my words to come out straight, my tongue would have to decompose. And I've amused, far too amused, with rhyming words and verbal curlicues. She has me dripping on my tongue each time we come upon a pun. 